So the, um, the other thing I'd like to read <coughs> is uh, uh, from a collaboration in my part of this project. Uh, it's called the Elder Series. And um, it was put on by um, uh, the, the New York group Belladonna. Um, basically, that's uh, Rachel Levitsky and Erica Kaufman with the help from their friends. And um, there were eight um, younger poets who were asked to choose um, uh, someone, um, you know, uh, you know, tottering toward old age, who um, they considered to be their elders who would, who would help them, you know, get started in poetry or made them want to write poetry or whatever. And Jane Sprague from Los Angeles, who does Palm Press, um, and who is a mother and, and she works and she goes to school and she writes poetry and she does the press and stuff. Uh, liked both um, myself and Diane Ward, another uh, poet who lives in LA but um, who was a friend um, uh, from uh, the DC area for a long time. And um, because we were sort of the same uh, kind of people who uh, we didn't have academic jobs but we continued to, um, to write anyway. <laughs> for whatever reasons we uh, came up with. But anyway, so the whole thing was about generations. And there's, a, there's an interesting, con all, all eight of the uh, Belladonna books have a conversation um, uh, between or among the poets involved. Our conversation was on generations. We took, we took that topic seriously. And then my piece um, is, is about generations as well. Uh, and I sort of combine my poetic generations, which would be um, uh, Francis Ponch, who really helped me get through the Vietnam War. I, won't, I don't have enough time to go into that. But <laughs> and um, Landscapes of Descent, this guerrilla poetry in public spaces, which is about uh, four, four uh, groups of poets in the United States now that are, that are trying to, to do some um, public uh, political poetry. And um, uh, when I you know, when I read their work and, and, you know, read their essays and things like that, it really, it encouraged me, it encouraged me. So this is, this, what I'm about to read now is sort of a, uh, an intertextual play on um, these two books. Um, and I'll start out by, there's a small, oh, it's in here. Um, there's a small uh, collab that we did at the beginning of our of putting this together, Jane and Diane and I. Um, so this is just Jane, Diane, and Tina, um, February 22nd, 2009. How you'll know me, not me. What's what we think? We happens lapsing into orange. I walk a ghost, arterial watching. This is how it is. I offer the word, Vietnam. Well, he dropped out, they often do, to me and you too across that happiness to never know, etched the comum rule of his giving in, and didn't know, but somehow small habits well pursued betimes my sight to practice in a place without one single cinematic memory take. I don't know how to include more sort of drunk than he than myself. When I have on the bus clocks across that fear of so much silence <clears throat> manipulated into some guy-eye vibration, gradations of the same, it's not going to be easy. Would have been how we offer the word as written out after embedded. A thought can still suspect in what's not before you or happened without you. Or no, that's not right, he flew at Nam, they told us. And now, today, I walk at people in power. I feel this still and never know how to tell, but why I write you, talk or talk. How many times when I come home, the door from my finger. This is sound the dignity. Spit, spit it. In the dead or very spit of, the amount of spade can hold across from spite. France, June 1943. It is necessary, and, and it is enough but necessary to have in hand, in the mouth, something more material and perhaps less natural, something artificial and voluble, something which displays itself, develops, and which loses itself, uses itself up at the same time, something which is very much like speech employed in certain conditions. In a word, a little piece of something. This sky blue nut of mist is necessary, this cloud of very fragile spheres, this prestigious stage scene behind which memory disappears. 
The memory of all dirtiness dissolves, and the worst solution, certainly, in this matter, is being led by your ID fixé, or that of your parents, to let yourself get soaked, arms folded, in some dull tributary of the Dead Sea. Fresh start, clean sweep. Long cases, sea cracks. One name's duck. How to do it, wish hop. So, the ding, image. Did anti-war demonstrators spit on Vietnam veterans as they returned from combat? Most veterans who remember being spat upon say it was done by women. The attacks did not occur around military bases, but at public airports such as LAX. There are no photos or newspaper articles to corroborate these incidents, only first-hand accounts. Their stories are much like those of German soldiers after World War I, which in turn the Nazi propaganda machine used to unify their base before World War II. Suffumigations, withdrawn it, memory pit, Italian tombs, tattoo, dug out of your sight. I tried to see Craxes, but I'm not having much luck. No dictionaries define it. I think it's a far flung typo. Finding it in the formula for Socrates' theory of causation, in the title for Cezanne's painting of three skulls, in the discussion of the endangered Waddle Curacao, in a technical description of magnetization, in a psychology text on human interaction, in a brochure describing the different kinds of quartz, and in a blog entry asking folks to stop giving neoconservative commentator Ann Coulter the attention she cracks. France, July 8, 1943. Thank God, a certain gibberish is called for concerning something, touching something. There is much more to be gibbered than said, touching something. And it's not necessary to disquiet oneself, to disquiet oneself about always saying the same thing. One may, one should gibber. To gibber is to say what? To make oneself a little ridiculous, to ridicule words a little, but always with something in hand. <laughs> Statistics vary regarding the number of conscientious objectors there were during World War II. My uncle Luke wasn't in any kind, even though he didn't believe the war was just. COs and their families were ostracized in the most tolerant communities, and my grandmother told Luke that no one in the family would have jobs with the city if he filed for CO status. So he went and was wounded in France by a U.S. airstrike. But Uncle Lou couldn't have qualified for CO status because he didn't oppose the war for religious reasons, the only valid criteria for granting a deferral at that time. Even though he was a regular reader of the Catholic Worker and Der Wanda, a conservative German Catholic newspaper, his opposition was political. The New Deal wasn't making enough money for the industrialists, so Roosevelt needed an armed conflict to keep him happy. <laughs> 